just finished a real love uh, retreat weekend, which was delightful. Um, unusual, I suppose, in the fact that uh, all 13 people made significant progress. Um, everybody learned something. Everybody. Um, when we were done, I couldn't think of a single thing to say to anybody, which is uh, kind of, I guess, remarkable in itself. Delightful, being with people who want to improve their lives. It's just miraculous to me. New subject. I've uh, known a woman who has resisted hearing the truth for a very long time. Uh, very manipulative uh, person. The more she tried, the harder it got for her uh, because she was fighting the truth uh, about herself, of course. She finally began to see the truth and then began to beat herself up because she hadn't seen it earlier. I suggested that that wouldn't help, but that be more productive just to focus on continuing to see the truth and to find and trust unconditional love. She was kind of beating herself up because she'd wasted so much time in her life, and I suggested that she not see all the time and effort as failure, just it's what it took to learn. It just takes what it takes. Some of us take 60 years. Um, I have a friend who was 80 years old before he woke up. Just, it is what it is. She wrote and said, Thanks for telling me that I haven't failed. Made me smile. My shame of failing is way bigger than my shame of not being able to see how inherently manipulative I am. Of course, you're probably right that I don't want to see it, admit it, even that I can't see. It's pretty laughable how blind I'm being. Um, I'm remembering your can't or won't blog or teaching. Right now, it doesn't make a huge difference. Enough agonizing on my part, she continues. The answer is to do something about it, and you're willing to guide me on what to do. It, Yeah so we can agonize and intellectualize and go on and on and beat ourselves up and go over the past and dissect it. Brrr. Doing post-mortems on poop is, I think, really kind of boring, but many of us do that. It really is as simple as, what do we do next? <clears throat> she says, my ex-husband uh, was red-green colorblind, so we would go blackberry picking with the kids and his bowl would always have mixed berries, ripe berries and obviously not. He knew he was red-green colorblind. He accepted it. He did not, being, not fight being told every single time that he was corrected about colors in the way that I've been fighting being told that I'm emotionally colorblind. Indeed, he always laughed about this. I think he rather enjoyed finding out uh, uh, his particular brand of specialness, using it. Uh, I could learn a lesson from him. Laughing, not weeping. Whatever it takes, so long as I'm teachable. Teachability might be the single trait that distinguishes those who learn from those who don't. Uh, certainly not intelligence, certainly not talent, it's not age, it's not trauma. And teachability is really kind of a form of Really, it's just another word for trusting, isn't it? Uh, if you're teachable, then you're trusting that somebody will teach you instead of defending yourself. She continues, I've been wanting to see my manipulation um, before I would believe you when you told me that I was manipulating you. So for those of you who are listening, many people insist on having a thing proven before they'll trust it. And see, that's backwards. Uh, it's what we do with lots of things. We want to have it proven that a thing is true before we believe that it's true. Um, no, it wouldn't be called trust or faith if, if it were proven. Um, or we want it proven that we're safe before we'll trust. No, it doesn't work like that. In fact, until you move forward while you're unsure about being safe, it's not really trust, is it? Um, she, she continues, simpler perhaps just to accept that I can't right now see my manipulation. No, you really can't, which is why I tell you about it first. This is important for everybody. 
find somebody to trust. They'll help you see things you can't see. If you have to have it proven first, you'll never see it. And even when they show it to you, you'll discount all the proofs. So much like geometry, I remember this clear as day, thinking this was the coolest thing uh, when I was in the whatever grade that was, uh, that you assume a theorem to be true, and then by manipulating it in various ways, you prove that it's true. But it starts off with an, with an assumption that it's true. Once you find somebody to trust, assume that what you're, that they're telling you is true, and then you will see it. Uh, it's when we are willing to see a thing that we finally do. When we're not willing to, we just don't. Um, she continues, so it's kind of like about time that I believe you, finally trust you, and you'll teach me other clues, like with the blackberries where the children delighted in teaching their dad not to simply go on the color to determine the ripeness, but also the feel, the smell, the ease of picking. So, woohoo! I have you to teach me some clues on how to recognize my tendency to manipulate people. It doesn't matter that others don't need to utilize these clues. Um, it matters that I just need to trust. I'm manipulation blind. So, Everybody can learn from this. Um, trust somebody. Listen to them. Don't fight them. Now, yeah, it matters who you trust. You don't want to pick somebody randomly off the street. But once you pick somebody who has at least some of the characteristics of being trustworthy, um, listen, I've done it all my life. With As I've learned surgery, I just trusted whoever was teaching me. As I learned to repel off cliffs, as I've learned to go deep into caves as I've learned all kinds of skills. I just found somebody that was already skilled at that and just followed them. It's infinitely easier than asking somebody to show you and then questioning everything that they tell you. It becomes really kind of stupid. In fact, when I call my son on the phone and I ask him what to do with the computer, I just follow him step by step. No matter what he tells me, even though I'm thinking, oh, this is going to just wreck everything, I just do what he says, and sure enough, it seems to work. The other way is just painful and doesn't work. Here's somebody who says, I need help with separating guilt and shame. When I feel guilty, adding shame really doesn't help. Guilt is feeling bad about something you have done. Shame is feeling bad about you. But those are really glib, easy definitions. Shame and guilt become inseparable when you start with shame, as nearly everybody does. So picture this. You're a child. Your parent goes by and says, what are you doing? Or what have you done? Or a million variations of that accompanied by a sigh, facial expression, the words really are fairly irrelevant. What do you hear as a child? That you've made a mistake? No. You hear that you are unacceptable. You are bad. You should be ashamed. Poof. That's shame. Now, here's the problem. The feeling of shame is associated with, immediately associated with, like within seconds, of making a mistake. But the mistake is only when the message of shame is delivered. See? It's not the source of the shame. Making the mistake doesn't make us shameful, but they're delivered. So, the, the message about the mistake and the shame are delivered so close together that we can't distinguish the two. Because the mistake and the expression of disgust or irritation from the parent, God, essentially, are linked by time, you will forever link mistakes with shame. You'll link guilt with shame. So now, every time you make a mistake, you feel that shame, having been conditioned, just like Pavlov's dogs were conditioned to salivate at the ringing of a bell, even when there was no meat there. It's a reflex. Mistakes therefore become by reflex, shameful. So how do you change this? Well, in much the same way that they deconditioned Pavlov's dogs. Um, 
you have to change the experience, change the association. You have to make mistakes, admit them, allow somebody who's loving to see you with the mistakes, and love you. So now, mistakes are associated with what? Shame? No. Mistakes are associated with loving. Crazy new association. Mistakes then just become mistakes. You just make them and go, uh, okay, so that didn't work. Now, we're not talking about blowing off mistakes or denying mistakes. You just learn that they don't make you bad, which is, well, you know, pretty huge because that's not true for most people. <clears throat> Here's somebody who says, we're having a family meeting tonight, and at one point, Jira, who's 13, and if I mispronounce that, well, shoot me, um, says this to me. Uh, I don't like it when you smile at me when I'm angry, because it makes it go away, <laughs> the anger. <laughs> the mother said I just had to chuckle. Children get angry for a reason. What is it? Obviously, because they're either empty or afraid. And two, because their anger works with the people around them. They get what they want. There's a reward for being angry. Pretty much every behavior that we do has a reward or we wouldn't keep doing it. Really. People don't keep doing unrewarded behaviors. Children tend to get what they want. The solution is so easy. Quit rewarding their anger. So, for example, one reason that kids get angry is, is that they feel, children on the whole feel relatively helpless. Uh, you know, do this, do that, put this on, take that off. I mean, they're told what to do all day long. And if they get angry and you adopt even the slightest facial expression of concern, just a crinkle of the brow, Oh, that's heaven for a kid, because you suddenly become like a marionette at the end of strings. Um, if you give in to the child's anger, you've rewarded it. If you get upset in return, it's still rewarding. It's been proven that children prefer um, negative behavior to being ignored. They prefer to be hit over being ignored. So if you get upset, you've rewarded them by engaging them with their anger. Any kind of response to their anger rewards it. So what's the so the solution is you don't you don't get emotionally involved and you simply do what you said you were going to do in the first place when they got angry so that you would change your mind. Lots of examples of that in the parenting book. Here's somebody who writes a uh, success story, double exclamation marks. Um, Susie, her daughter, um, got up too late to catch a ride with her dad uh, to school. His, the dad was going to work and she was going to school and tried to manipulate me with anger and victimhood to get me to give her a ride to high school because she doesn't like to ride the bus. She declared then that she was not going to school. This is classic manipulation 101 from kids. I told her, oh, well, that's not an option. So, no, the kid is manipulating. The mother doesn't reward the manipulation. No anger, no emotional upset, just, oh, well, that's not one of your choices. Um, so, you can choose the, you can go to school on, on the bus, which you don't like, or you can ride your bicycle to school. Bless your heart, honey, that you didn't give in to the little manipulative thing with the kid. Then she asked if I was mad, and I wasn't. So I said, no. She still got angry. I didn't become afraid, and I responded with, why are you angry? You choose poorly this time, but you, you chose poorly this time, but you can choose differently next time. And still she kept attacking. I realized that she was getting angry to try to intimidate me or get me mad, which is what we were just talking about. That's why kids do it, is to get you to react to their anger, even though they're not conscious of it. You continue. Then I'd be wrong, and maybe she'd get what she wanted in the fallout, at least a little power for her, which is what we've been saying. I saw that it was just another way of 
cracking the door, her anger, and then poof, zoom, they're out, like you talked about yesterday when we talked on the phone. It didn't work because I stayed calm. And I said, sweetie, I'm not afraid. I'm not angry. You can't control that. Really. Bingo. I hit the nail in the head. You really did. You saw what was happening and you responded according to your knowledge and confidence. Your lack of anger gave you a power beyond describing. The instant you become involved in the conflict, you're dead. You become powerless. So you did perfectly here. In fact, you're, once you're angry, your ability and right to, to teach disappear. You say, she said she was sorry, and it was wrong of her to try and manipulate me. Her choice of words. She realized that she'd been manipulating. Kind of amazing that she identified that word. She repeated that what she did was wrong, but then she began to beat herself up emotionally for being angry at me. And I smiled and I said, no, it was wrong because it made you unhappy. She interrupted and repeated how wrong she was, but I didn't take the bait. My kid can be a pretty sophisticated manipulator. I just smiled and said, yes, you were wrong. Then I stopped talking. No more blah, 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 no more teaching. Just loved her with a look. Poof, she headed out for the bus. This is trusting. I've said over and over that People ask that question probably more than any other. What does trust look like? This is an example. Here's this kid manipulating, trying anger, trying beating herself up, trying beating the mother up, trying everything on earth. What did the mother do? She just stood there in utter calm in her Zen wisdom and just loved and taught her daughter. How did it turn out? Because she trusted the power of loving and teaching. Worked out perfectly. You continue. I told her I'd be available to talk more with her uh, about why her life sucks, one of the phrases she used, <laughs> after school. <laughs> I see again how the only answer is really letting go and trusting her, trusting myself, trusting the truth, trusting, the, trusting love. Anything short of that just results in a big tangled mess. That, this is a really great story. It's a great story about trusting, about parenting, about all of that stuff. Just magnificent. Here's somebody that writes, <clears throat> I'm on a plane today, apparently, as she was writing this, I guess. And somehow when I'm on a plane, that gets me thinking about mortality. Yeah, that does with many people. This time, it's wondering whether it's wise or fearful to plan for or at least discuss what either my husband or I would do if the other dies. Yeah, uh, but first I would ask what you think about dying. Uh, you brought up mortality, the Latin root of the word meaning death, of course. So think about the concepts. I'm not going to force any answer on you. Consider them before you talk about what you're going to do about dying. What does it mean to you to die? What happens when you die? Who, who is God? What is God? Is there a God? Uh, uh, am I content with what I know about these things? When you think about mortality, it's a certainty that these questions are operating in the background. You see? And if they're, the answers to those questions are not clear to you, they're going to be affecting you and they're going to be affecting the answers you come up with, with what do we do when we die? So I just a suggestion that you consider the root questions first. You continue. Part of my thoughts involve my mom and brothers, whom I recently saw, one of whom kept looking at me as if I'd grown horns and kept asking me if I was okay. I get that they're confused by me now about how I have changed in the last couple of years as a result of living real love, and, and I feel more separated from them in many ways. This is completely natural. You have deviated now significantly from what they consider to be normal. So you're strange to them. We talked last week about outliers. In the family, now you are an outlier. Weird, odd, different, and people get uncomfortable when they're around different. Remember, if you change, they usually have to do one of two things. 
they have to consider that you might be changing for the better and consider whether they might benefit from doing the same. Nah, too much work. Or two, they just label you as odd, as having run off the rails, that there's something wrong with you. Much easier way of dealing with an outlier. You continue, then today the thought of, what would I do if my husband dies comes to mind. We're at a crossroads in our life with no roots really, um, living a fun life, but not really with old friends or family nearby, the kind of, not really the kind of people who would necessarily love me, but would be up for doing, you know, practical things like taking the kids for a few nights. But nobody really who would function like family uh, at times of sickness or death. My real love family will give me spiritual and emotional strength, but what about this practical stuff? You know, if one of us died. I wonder if this is what lies beneath my continuing, though diminished, fear of losing my family, that I would lose this support. And then I realize that's kind of selfish of me, that I've been looking at my family as kind of just, you know, being there in case somebody dies. Um, I would suggest that you see this differently. You're losing your illusion about what you thought you had with your family. So now the important question is, what do you have? At period, like altogether. How is your relationship with your husband? What's it really like? What's your relationship with the kids? What's your relationship with God? What's your confidence about you being you? When you can answer these questions clearly and progress to what you want the answers to be to those questions, you're going to discover that your concerns about everything else will tend to diminish. We tend to go to answering second and third stage questions instead of answering the important ones first. And I've gone through a number of those important questions. Then, after you've answered all those questions, then at least think about what you'd do if one of you dies. Mm. Things like insurance, like things like who would you leave your kids with? But boy, it's pretty rare those things become necessary. Like planning details, pretty impossible. There's too much that could happen between now and then. Way more important that you work on making your family happy now. And as you feel happy, as you feel connected to more and more people, as you understand what the real function of your family and your life is, as you come to understand who you are, because you'll lose your fears, you'll just kind of come to a more natural resolution about what you should do about things like what to do if your partner dies. You won't make great decisions while you're still in fear or you're still uncertain about those more foundational questions that we were talking about. That's kind of deep stuff we're talking about here, but it matters. Sylvie, Sylvie's story. Sylvie recently had her hair cut and uh, a friend of hers, I, I'm assuming another four-year-old, said, oh, did you get your hair cut? That's ugly. Sylvie says, want to ride bikes? <laughs> this is pretty good. <laughs> imagine if adults dealt with conflicts like that. As, can you imagine how two adults would deal with this? Your hair is really ugly. Yeah, well, so are you. <laughs> it would just go straight downhill. Or they'd be offended or whatever. Want to ride bikes. Um, Jeanette wrote that the kids were being kids, you know, like they're four, three, and little, uh, less than one. Um, and they were having to be chased down and corralled and whatever for mealtime or baths. And, and Jeanette was having a hard time getting them all together in one place. And Bruce, three, says to um, his mother, are you done being angry now? Are you ready to say you're sorry? <laughs> How do you keep being angry as a parent when a three-year-old asks you if you're ready to say you're sorry? Priceless. Here's somebody who says, Today in the parking lot, I was trying to be courteous to another driver, indicating that he could go around me while I waited for a parking space. 
he flipped me off. Uh, for those from other cultures, he gave her an indication with one of his fingers that he was highly displeased with her. But instead, I pulled forward and I allowed the guy who had been rude to me to take the parking space that I was waiting for. Such an act would have been unthinkable for me before real love. Actually, knowing you, this would have been, this, this is something of a miracle. Um, you let an offense roll off your back, like, whoa. And then returned his exceptional rudeness with kindness. Something is changing deep in your soul. And this, again, is an example of trusting. Trust isn't words. Trust is believing in a principle so much that it changes your behavior. Until then, pfft, it's just talk. Here's somebody who says, I have a three-year-old son. Anytime his younger sister crawls in his general direction, even if she's actually going after something different, he starts to scream and tries to physically hit her or push her away in order to protect his stuff. What is something that I can say or do in this situation that will love my son and simultaneously protect my daughter? I've tried picking him up and just holding him or hugging him, but then he thrashes and thrashes and kicks and screams until I remove my daughter. Um, sometimes I just pick her up and leave the area, but then that probably doesn't make my son feel very loved. So any ideas? What we tend to do, not just kids, this isn't just a question about kids, is to solve the conflict. We solve the crisis so that it will go away. So then that's why you like pick him up um, to make the crisis stop, or you move the daughter. Well, then the crisis is temporarily over, but nobody learns anything. So let's consider what we want taught. Since our job as parents, or as, frankly, supervisors at work, or teachers at school, or wherever it is that we're in charge of teaching people, supervising them, let's consider what we want taught since our job as parents is loving and teaching. First, loving is always first, so you can't be the least bit concerned as you take action. You have to teach your son, Johnny, I didn't, I don't remember getting his name, a life lesson with the same coolness, the same level-headedness that you would teach him that two plus two is four. There's no emotion behind two plus two is four. It's just how it is. This is how we teach life lessons with the same tone of voice. So what are the lessons? What's the thing that you want to teach your son? Uh, what's the most important thing in life? Happiness. That's what you want to teach your kid. If we don't remember that's the primary lesson, we won't teach it, and then everybody loses. And how do we be happy? By feeling loved, by being loving, and by being responsible. So let's see how those three lessons would play out with a little kid crawling toward the three-year-old's toys. First, loved. That, that involves primarily no irritation from you and that calm tone of voice. You can convey love just with a, a look. Loving. You want to teach him to be loving. So you teach this three-year-old, and at three, he can understand. Bruce gets it at three, so can your child. In our family, we tolerate no unfocused expression. That's wild, crazy expression of anger or violence toward anybody. That applies to everyone. So you don't get to do unfocused expression of anger. or An example of unfocused anger is screaming. That's unfocused anger. Whereas a child saying to his mother, I am so angry at my sister. Well, that's perfectly acceptable. That's focused, articulate expression of anger. So no unfocused expression of anger or violence ever. So that means none of the three-year-old toward the sister, none of the sister toward him. It's not a one-way deal. That also means no expressions of anger 
on your part toward him or your sister or you towards your husband or your husband toward you. The whole family lives by the same rules. Kids do way better when everybody lives by the same rules than when they're the only ones that have to do it. And of course, then you get to be angry, but he doesn't. Oh, kids hate hypocrisy and they pick up on it immediately. None ever. If you do, you explain to him, if you do express your anger in an unfocused way, like scream, then I will come down and I will say to you, say this to me in English. So I will give you a chance to say it to me in English, in which case then we will do something to make the situation better. But if you continue the unfocused expression of anger, you lose all your toys. So, hmm, let's think through this. And three-year-olds are old enough to do this. Bruce is. Hmm, so if you scream, you lose all your toys. Whereas if you don't scream, you get to keep all your toys. Which strikes you as the smarter way to go? They catch this, they catch on to this really very quickly. So if you keep it up then, even after losing your toys, then you're going to go to your room and be alone. So if you want to do that, great, it's up to you. That teaches a kid not necessarily to be loving, but at the very least, not to be unloving, which is a start for a three-year-old. Being loving for, at age three, eh, it's questionable whether they can even do that. Now, three, responsibility. Number of ways to teach responsibility here. Number of, actually, more than one kind of responsibility. First, he's responsible for speaking his fears. We talked about this just a moment ago, unfocused anger. Speaking them, not just vomiting them. And three-year-olds understand that. You speak it, not just throw it up with kids. Little boys especially enjoy references to bodily functions. Um, so you give him examples. You might say, Mom, she's coming again. Give him the words. He's not just going to suddenly become articulate emotionally. Mom, she's going to touch my things. Mom, here she comes. Mom, here comes the toy monster. Turn it into something fun for the kid. Um, but see, now he's speaking in English instead of screaming. I taught my kids at a very early age that we don't speak whining. I don't speak whining. I don't understand whining. What, what, what are you saying? I don't get it. We don't speak screaming. We speak English. So if you speak to me in English, I will respond to you in English. If you speak to me in whining or screaming, then you get to go to your room until you can remember the English words for that. And that takes, you know, about two or three trips and they're done with that foolishness because who, who's going to sit in their room and whine to themselves? You know, I mean, even whiners hate their whining. Then you make him, all right, so first he's responsible for speaking. Now, second, this one's really tricky and it's kind of clever. You make him responsible for what is his. These are his toys. One aspect of being responsible for something is having power over your responsibility. In other words, the kid owns his toys. So he's responsible for putting them away. He's responsible for taking care of them and not breaking them because they're his toys. Whenever you give somebody responsibility or responsibility, you also give them authority to carry out their responsibility. So he owns the toys. So he gets to know that he owns his stuff. A huge mistake that parents make is that like when Johnny has a toy and sister Susie comes up and screams that she wants the toy and they're doing the, every parent has seen this, it's mine, it's mine, you know, and then somebody usually gets hit and they're crying, it's kind of boring, um, is that whoever has the toy, whoever's holding the toy, owns it for the moment. Don't, don't sit. There's, there's a lot of ways to do this. If it's a little kid, like a two-year-old, and they're holding a toy, and the toy belongs to the older brother, you're not going to be able to spit, explain ownership to the two-year-old. So you just tell the older brother, look, she's got it for a minute, she's going to drop it, and then you can have it back. But with children who are old enough to understand, like a six and an eight-year-old, for example, whoever owns the toy gets to have the toy. And then they get to decide whether they want to share that with anybody else. If a kid 
feels like they don't own their own toys. They feel enormously disempowered. They feel helpless. They just hate it. So the toys are his. They're his responsibility. You're going to help him come up with a solution. Again, another level of responsibility. So here you're teaching responsibility on multiple levels. So for example, you, you could come up with some solutions that he could choose from and then ask him if he has some others. You could, for example, uh, you can get it pretty much any toy store or frankly Walmart or wherever, or Amazon, you can buy everything probably including live ele elephants. You can get these little um, gates that come in sections. In fact, I'm looking over at some right here for when the grandchildren arrive. Um, and we use them just for this purpose. You can take these little gates and you can create around his toys a little wall. So there's his wall around his toys. Well, how cool do you think he's going to feel? He understands that they're his. He understands responsibility. He understands that you're trying to help him. He feels safer. And then it's your job to provide the little Susie with something else to do, uh, as opposed to settling disputes all the time. The kids learn to feel loved. They learn to be loving, or at least not unloving. And they learn to be responsible, all from an interaction over toys. Very cool. I talked to a woman who just went on and on and on about the people who have hurt her. And I said, have you ever told these stories before? She said, well, yeah, as though she was surprised that I would know such a thing. <laughs> Anybody who goes on and on has practiced telling this story. And I said, and yet you're still telling these stories. And it's pretty obvious that you're not happy. So what does that tell you? Well, she was pretty smart. She said, mm, maybe that I don't need to keep talking about the past. Exactly. She said, but then how will people know who I am? That's a good question. And don't I need to talk about the past in order to get rid of it? Two good questions. Me. The past is like poop in a toilet. You can keep it. You can swirl it, you can pick it up, you can share it with the neighbors. You can keep bringing it up over and over again, or just flush it. Everybody knows there's been poop in the toilet. You don't have to show it to them to get them to know you. You don't have to keep bringing it up to get rid of it. You just flush it. She said, but then what would I talk about? What else is there? And I said, well, what am I doing right now? She said, loving me. So I taught her to talk about that and the love of another friend that she has in real love. And then she thought of another thing to talk about that didn't involve talking about the past. Um, and I'll be seeing her soon. She's coming from across an ocean, something she never thought would have been possible. We can choose what we think about. And as we choose, we choose what we become. It can all be done in the present. I talked recently with an older man whose life has been one disaster after another. Uh, he learned about real love and he found someone to feel it from in person. And today I spent, or just the other day, I spent 20 minutes with him laughing almost the entire time. It, it, it was just a delightful experience all because he's discovered what it's like to feel loved. He described a conflict in his house where he started raising his voice, and then he realized that he was just being ridiculous, and he simply stopped and apologized. He realized that his anger was filling the house and just ruined any possibility of joy in his family. So he chose to feel loved, and he really did feel it. He has a gift for being exuberant, for being energetic, for being out there, and when he exercises that gift, influenced by fear, we talked about this last week, when he takes that native gift of exuberance and energy but adds fear, he poisons the house. When he exercises it with love, he touches everyone with peace. My whole day was changed just by being with him. It was just lovely.
last Saturday, I had a, uh, a scheduled call with, uh, let's see here. Ah, here we are. This is somebody else. This wasn't me. Uh, somebody wrote and told me, they said, last Saturday, I had a scheduled call with Garth. Uh, we'd been having a regular call for more than a month, and on this particular Saturday, he didn't answer. My reaction was driven by emptiness and fear. I wondered what I did to cause him not to answer or why he had decided not to answer my call. He responded to a text the following day and we rescheduled the call for this morning. While we were having the call, Garth gave no explanation why we hadn't talked the day before and I didn't ask. We discussed why I was making real love calls and I said that I was making them because it was the best way I knew to be happy. He asked me if I saw results from that. I said, well, yes, but they've been inconsistent. He asked why. I said, mm, I wasn't always capable of feeling loved and that even if I wasn't capable of feeling it, it didn't mean it didn't exist. And in that moment, I realized that this truth spread to many other avenues of my life. The analogy that you have used, the spending a pleasant nine minutes with you followed by one minute of you screaming at me and chasing me with a knife, really only affects victims in negative ways. As a victim, I have believed my entire life that if somebody doesn't love me the right way, all the time, then even the good and loving things they do are negated by the unloving things they do. I knew that Garth loved me, and his missing a call just didn't matter. It was unimportant when, when compared with that truth. So we didn't discuss it. We didn't need to. Something that was a first for me. He could figuratively, maybe exaggerating a little, um, chase me with a knife for a minute, and that didn't stop me from feeling his love. His not showing up for whatever reason was his choice, and he didn't need to stop it for me to feel loved or for me to feel accepted by him. Even as I'm writing this, I realize that I was being the most loving I think I've ever been and didn't realize it at the time. I wasn't trying or worrying about it. I simply was. And it's a great feeling. Again, here's an example of somebody just trusting. He's had one loving experience after another with Garth, and for who cares what reason, uh, Garth missed their call. Who knows? Maybe he forgot about it. Maybe the phone lines went dead. Maybe he was passed out drunk on the floor of his bathroom. Who knows? But whatever the reason was, the guy didn't even need to know. He just chose to trust that Garth still loved him. And as a result, he felt loved. Pretty beautiful. As opposed to what we usually do, which is demand an explanation. And then even if we get one, we don't. It's not really usually quite enough. And as soon as we demand an explanation, our feeling of being loved is gone anyway. Another person says, I live in my head so much of the time that it's like I have no connection with my body. And I have no idea what it feels like to be truly grounded and living in the present. I'm an observer of life and events rather than a participant. Although there are photos and memories to prove that I've done certain things and been certain places. Is this due to chronic running? Yeah, and mostly chronic pain, which has been blinding. It's been proven that when people are in pain, they don't later remember what happened or what they did. And it doesn't have to be physical pain. It could be emotional pain. It could be fear, it could, whatever. People become blind, crazy, and even stupid. Their actual thought processes are altered when they're in pain, whether it's PTSD or PCSD. And then this person writes, so that'd be like PCSD. Mm -hmm. And protecting myself from having real relationships with people. Yes, of course. Because if you've been in pain all of your life and you've detached and gone up into your head, you've proven that having relationships with people has just been too painful. And is the answer, you say, to keep going with real love and trust that in time it will get better? Time won't help. Um, and I know this person as I say this, if you keep going at your present rate and intensity, you'll probably get the same results. You need something more intensive. 
whatever it is. Um, get a coach. Um, have more regular calls with somebody who's not a coach, somebody who's a wise person. Um, go to a retreat. You, you, by in your own words, you're so up in your head that you feel like you're detached from your body. There's your clue. So having conversations where you can slip into your head, which is pretty easy to do on the phone, isn't going to work. Reading a book is certainly not going to work. You're gonna, you can do that in your head. You need intimate, close contact with people, preferably in person. Here's a very angry and victim-y woman who writes, I've been in bed crying because I see that I, pro this is in capital letters, I provoke people to their breaking point. I get power from it. I actually take pride in being able to get underneath anyone's skin and make them react to me. Mm, yep, you really do. And I've seen you do it many times. Most of the time it's not quite conscious, but it's thrilling that you at least see it. I've even made jokes that are intended to irritate people. No matter how virtuous anyone can try to be, I can thwart that and make them show their, quote, true, end quote, colors. I can break them like a horse. And even more twisted is that I justify it to myself by telling myself that I'm merely forcing the truth to come out. That's pretty sneaky. Uh, I'm just bringing that darkness out into the light. Wow, what a service you do to mankind. <laughs> wow, how lucky we are to have you <laughs> to bring the darkness into the light. And I'm sure you can see how incredibly self-righteous it is. But it's also fun to see. I mean, you could feel bad about this for the rest of your life, that you've tortured people. Or you could just feel free. You, you haven't seen it before, not, not consciously really seen it. You might have been aware of it in the background. You might have even taken pride in it. You can do that without really seeing it for what it is. This is freeing. You continue. It is so sick and sadistic, monstrous even. Yeah, but remember that the monstrosity mostly affects you. It just keeps you alone. And you learned this skill as a child. So, yeah, monstrous, but mm, not your fault. You continue. It's exactly what I feel my dad did to me, just what I was talking about. You learned it. And it's like he won because no matter how hard I tried to resist his trying to break me, his monster, his demons, nonetheless took up residence in me. And it's why I wanted to kill myself my whole life because I desperately wanted to kill off that monster. I'd rather be dead than be that sick monster. Well, bless your heart, kid. Hooray. Now you see the sickness. Uh, you know what it is. Um, you know what the alternative is. You have people to help you. So you don't need to let your dad win all these years later, even though he's been dead in the ground for years. I'd be kind of sad, actually, to have him succeed in converting you to his way of being. I know a lady who's been through coaches and wise men and jobs like water through her fingers. And she wrote, she said, I've blown it again and I may have to leave the house that I'm staying in and end up homeless again. I live in a house that takes two boarders who each live in a single room. And I just received a text message from one of the owners of the house detailing more things that I had done that were not thinking of them, the owners, that I needed to be quiet while I was cooking in the middle of the night, that I couldn't have friends come over to the house. Uh, but it wasn't my fault because somebody showed up without my knowing that it would happen. The theme, my dear, is this. And it's something that I've seen cause you to stumble so many times that I can state the theme with no doubt at all. Think about other people. It's that simple. You don't have to memorize the thousand things that irritate people. That would just become, well, impossible and way too legalistic. 
Just think about what you're doing and how it, would, how it might affect others. Not be afraid of how it might affect others. Just think. So cooking in the middle of the night. Let's see. Let's look at that phrase. Middle of the night. What do people do in the middle of the night? Usually sleeping. And cooking usually involves metal objects that bang against other metal objects. Banging pots. Um, just think of your behavior. No fear, just awareness. Uh, like you said, a friend came over. Probably somebody you know. Um, well, if they're a friend, I guess they'd kind of have to be, wouldn't they? Um, how easy would it have been for you to email all of your friends since you've been homeless and since you've gone from place to place and job to job? It's not like you'd have a list of a thousand close friends. So just saying, no criticism. So you email all of your known friends and you just say, um, I live in a place where you would need to contact me by email or by text or whatever so that I can arrange to meet you elsewhere. The people that own the house where I'm living have a rule that may be a little bizarre that other people came over, can't come over to the house, but it's their house and, and you agreed to board there, so you agreed to the rule but you don't think about what other people need. Now, it's understandable that you don't when you're in pain, but eventually you really have to consider them. Or what happens is they withdraw, they kick you out, they fire you, as has happened many times now, whatever. So I know you're in pain, but when you don't think about others, at least to the point where you're not overtly unloving, then they end up doing things to you that make you feel even more unloved and you just make your own situation worse. Thinking about other people is just a guideline that you need to consider all the time or you lose. It's just not complicated. It's not more work like being quiet while you're cooking in the middle of the night. How much extra work is it to lift up a pan gently as opposed to banging it down on the stove? Mm, half a second? All you have to do is think about it. Will this noise affect anybody but me? And why should they have to put up with my being inconvenient? You continue. I'm not thinking of other people. This is a huge problem. That's what the real issue was in my being fired from my last job. It was the last straw and why I keep ending up in these messes. So what is the effect of my behavior on other people? An important question all the time. But not, now listen, not will other people like me? If I do this, that's an entirely different question. Just how will they be affected? You don't want to turn it into that you're doing things so they'll like you. And for the benefit of those who are listening to this little discussion between her and, and me, um, this pattern has just influenced everything she's done. She will often, for example, she'll get a job, brand new job, and then just not show up at work. Or get a job and work for a week and then just not show up for two or three days. And then, poof, she's fired. She doesn't think about how it will affect the people at work when she doesn't fill her shift. She, she'll take breaks at work that instead of being 15 minutes that are allotted, she, she'll take a break for an hour. Um, thinking about other people is just, it's, the, it's the, like the lowest level of loving. So what can I do to at least not be unloving? And oddly, we've talked about this three or four times now in the same video chat. Another lady wrote me that she texted me just a few days ago and said, you know, I'm, I'm just really not feeling all that great in the morning. And, and, and I'm in a new job that I've had for three days. Should I go to work? Yeah. Um, you've been working for three days. And so then all the boss is going to do is go, let's see, out of four days, she's missed one. Not highly reliable. To, to, just to give you a kind of a perspective, uh, I was a surgeon for 20 years. And out of 20 years of operating on people, how many days of work did I miss? Zero. Because you just do the job. I mean, there have been times when I've been operating or seeing a patient and said, excuse me, just for a second, I'll be right back. Uh, gone into the next room, thrown up, and then just come back and act like nothing's happened. You just do it. Uh, I'll just, I'll never forget reading a, a paper, and I haven't been able to find the paper since. I've Googled it a hundred different ways. But it was a kid who 
in college was uh, not feeling all that great. And so he didn't finish a paper that he was supposed to do. And he came to the professor and asked if he could have an extension for a day because he wasn't feeling his best. Or any of the phrase was all that great. And his professor said something to him and the, the student wrote it down in a way that I've remembered it now 40 years later. The professor said, most of the great accomplishments throughout the history of the world have been made by people who just didn't feel all that great. I thought, okay, I got the point. <laughs> if you're looking for a reason not to be responsible, you will find one. And if you say to yourself, I am going to get this done, even if I don't feel great, you tend to get it done. Um, this, the last uh, thing from this lady who was banging pots in the kitchen, I just want to find a way for this to work. I want to actually live a life instead of being fired from every job and thrown out of every house because of my selfish irresponsibility. Well then, honey, just do it. Uh, it's possible. You can do this. Think about others, which is just the first rung of loving people. Be responsible. Feel loved. The three stools of uh, three legs of the stool of happiness. Um, and you can do this. It's just not all that complicated. So same for the rest of us. Uh, being happy, just it's simple. And overall, it's easier than not being happy. Not being happy involves anger and guilt and recriminations and selfishness and people being mad at us and have to, are having to constantly manipulate people or be manipulated by other people. That's a lot of work much simpler just to find the love that we need. Trust it. Remember it. Share it with the people around us the best we can. That's all we can do. Not perfectly. Do all these things just the best we can, and we will be happy. Promise. See you in a week.